Good morning. It's great to spend this moment with you today. We're uh, overjoyed to have all of you who are here in this room this morning. We are uh, overjoyed to have as many as we have uh, worshiping with us online. Uh, What we're doing today, what we do right here and now, really matters. It, It makes a difference. And so I'm very happy to spend this time in God's Word with you today. So there was a there was a commercial that, that ran for who knows how long, and I'm thinking you probably saw it, and I'm guessing you can probably also finish this sentence. There are some things money can't buy. Do you know the rest? For everything else, there's MasterCard. I'm guessing you probably saw that commercial how many times? And you've got to admit that that is kind of genius level marketing here because not only do you still remember that so many years later but also that commercial is saying something that we all know to be true there are some things in life that money just can't buy and so the commercial will likely give you some examples of that they might show you little Timmy in that moment when he dropped his ice cream cone when the gorilla roared at the San Diego Zoo. And it'll say, like, that moment was, what? It was priceless. But in order to get to that priceless moment, you had to buy the plane ticket, and you had to book the hotel, and you had to get the rental car, and you had to pay for the parking and the admission, and you had to splurge on that two-scoop chocolate cone. And, yeah, there are some things money can't buy, but... For everything else, you got to spend your way to those priceless moments. Spend your way to them. So that's what the very smart advertisers at MasterCard would have us to believe. So do we believe that? Is that really how it works? Well, that's something that our passage from Scripture today is going to have a lot to say about. We are continuing today in the Gospel of Luke, where we've been for the past several weeks, and this morning will be no different. We're back in Luke today, and we are continuing as well this morning to look specifically at what the Gospel of Luke has to say about living a life of discipleship. Like, how do we live our lives the Jesus way, the way that Jesus would have us live them, the way that he modeled with his life, the way he spoke to us with the teachings throughout his ministry. So we'll continue to look today at how to live a life that's truly a life of discipleship. And that theme takes us to Luke chapter 12 today. Luke 12, if you'd like to get out a Bible and be turning there, that's what we're going to be in. And what we're going to find in Luke chapter 12 is a topic that the Gospel of Luke has more to say about than any other Gospel. Actually, if you take Luke and Acts together, Luke has more to say about this than any other person who writes any of the books of the Bible. But it's also a topic that can be a little bit easy to avoid. Today, we are looking at what Jesus has to say about possessions, the things that we have, and what we do with them. And I think that what we're going to find today is that Jesus has a little different view on possessions than the advertisers at MasterCard, and yet it has everything to do with those things that money can't buy. So let's take a look. Luke chapter 12 We're going to start in verse 13, and this first verse sort of draws us into this passage with this tiny little story, this little disagreement between two brothers that, as you'll see, Jesus doesn't really want to have anything to do with. But what he does do is he uses this moment, this disagreement, to teach us about discipleship and the things we have, the things that we possess. And so it sort of becomes this launching off point for not one, but two important teachings that have a lot in common. So let's start verse 13. Here's the little tiny story. Someone 
in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And you just know that his brother loves this, right? Here they are in this big crowd, and he's bringing up their money stuff in front of Jesus and everybody. He's got to really be thrilled about that, right? Well, Jesus is not so thrilled about it either, it doesn't seem. So verse 14, his response is, friend, who set me to be the judge or the arbiter over you? Like, I don't really want to have to do with any of this business between you and your brother. But what I will tell you is this. Teaching section number one, he said to them, take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, keep that sentence right there in mind, because we're going to be back with this one. It's very important. And then he told them a parable. He said, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. So he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul or to myself, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared... Whose will they become? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Now think about those two brothers in the crowd like them as they hear this teaching. But Jesus is not done yet. No sooner has he said this than he launches into teaching number two. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, Or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse or barn. And yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Hold on to that sentence, too. We'll be back with that one, too. Can anyone, by worrying, add a single hour to their life? If then you're not able to do a small thing as that, why do you worry about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? So do not keep striving for what you are to eat or what you are to drink, and do not keep worrying. That's what the nations of the world strive after, all these things. And your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and all these things will be given to you as well. Last thing, do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven, where neither thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And by this point, those two brothers that started off this story, they have just faded completely from view. We never hear about them again. We don't know what happens. We, we never find out. Because now the focus has just totally shifted to this new perspective on how we view the things that we have. And I really do mean it when I say this is a new perspective. Because what Jesus is describing here is not the kind of mindset that those two brothers came to him with that question. It's not the kind of mindset that they had. And when Jesus says this is the kind of thing you ought to strive after in your life, it is something different. He's telling them to strive after something different 
than what all of the nations of the world strive after, he says. And that was true then. I kind of think it's still true now. So Jesus is giving this whole new way of looking at the things we have, our possessions. It's very countercultural. And doesn't it all boil down to this? The disciple who lives the Jesus way is one who knows that there are things that money can't buy. MasterCard was right about that much. There are things that money can't buy. And if we look carefully at these teachings, I bet we could probably make a list, couldn't we? So it started with that man. He was already a rich man, you notice in verse 16, before he has this bumper crop of a year. He has this great windfall. And so here's a person who had a lot to begin with. Now he has a whole lot more. This is a person who has those things that money can buy. But by the end of the story, what does he learn? There are some things money can't buy. Money can buy you a safety net, a nice nest egg. But can it really bring true security? What does this man learn? And money can add comfort and leisure. He says, relax, eat, drink, be merry. But can it really bring true peace? You can add to your barns and your storehouses, but can you really add to your life, like your hours, your days, your years? Storing up possessions can make you rich in this life, but does it really make you rich toward God? That's the last thing Jesus said at the end of this parable. He he said something in verse 21. He says, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. So throughout this story, Jesus is teaching us that There are some things that money can't buy. And the person who knows this is going to realize that one person's life does not consist in the things that they possess. Your life is more than your possessions. Your life is more than what you have. And it's also more than what you don't have. That's where the second teaching comes in, which is really one and the same, only this time we're not taking the example of this man who seems to have everything. Now the examples are ravens and lilies. They're they're things that seem to possess nothing. But what is it saying? Isn't it the same? There are some things money can't buy. So money can put food in your stomach. It can fill you with food. But can it keep your heart from being filled with worry? Not on its own. Jesus said, think about the ravens. They have neither a storehouse nor a barn like the man in the first story. But they have something that that man didn't have, right? What is it? Something money can't buy. And money might could put clothing on your back. But can it really bring true beauty? True glory? Here's where Jesus talks about Solomon, who had all the money in the world, but the lily of the field had something that not even Solomon had. And what is it? It's something money can't buy. And just as Jesus said to the rich man who had everything, it seemed... One's life does not consist in what you have. Now he turns and says to those who worry about what they don't have, the same thing. Can you even add a single hour to your life by worrying about these things? There are some things money just can't buy. And the disciple who lives the Jesus way is called to live like they know this to be true whether they have a lot like the barn-building man or whether they have a little like the ravens, 
and the lilies, the disciple knows that there are things that money can't buy. And how does that change them? How does that change us? What benefit is it to our lives if we really take this to heart? We really believe what Jesus is saying here. Well, I'd like to focus on two things that it might change in us. One of them is a lesson about what we trust. The other is a lesson about what we seek. So first, it's this. When we view our possessions the Jesus way, we learn to trust God and not ourselves. Isn't that what the ravens and the lilies symbolized, right? What makes them different than the rich man with the big barns? What do they have that Solomon doesn't have? Well, they just exist in total dependence on God. God feeds them, verse 24. God clothes them, verse 27. God provides everything that they have. And you know, come to think of it, Solomon and the, and the man with the big barns, they're actually not so different from that either. I mean, where did all the things that the man had, where did they come from? And was he the one that made his crops such a banner year? Like, was he the one that made that miracle of a seed sprouting and yielding fruit? So what's the issue here then? Is it that he built a barn, or is it that he made it all about himself? We talked about verse 21, which said that he was storing up for himself and not rich toward God. Here's something else you might have noticed. Not one single time in that whole story does the man thank God, remember God. Not once does he recognize that God is the one who clothes him, the one who feeds him. There's no mention of God whatsoever, not by the man. But how many times does he say, me, myself, and I? First thing he does he consults not with God, but thinks to himself, what should I do? Now just count the eyes, the eyes and the me's. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my good, and I will say to myself, self? You've done pretty well for yourself. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God, verse 20, and that's the first time God is mentioned, and it's not by that man. God had different plans in mind. I don't think the problem is that he built a barn. The problem is that he no more fed himself than the ravens, and yet all he ever said was, I, 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 I. He no more clothed himself than the lilies in the field. But the only person he ever consulted about what to do with all this stuff was me, 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 me. He never considered once where the treasures of his earthly life had come from, much less those things that even the treasures in his life could not do for him. But the disciple who lives the Jesus way doesn't have to live that way. The disciple who views their possessions like Jesus is teaching us, we know where they come from. And we know who to put our trust in. It's not in ourselves. We learn to trust in God. That's the lesson about what we trust. The second one goes hand in hand with that. It's about what we seek. When we learn to view our possessions the Jesus way, we learn to seek those things that, well, those things that really last. And they turn out to be the things that money can't buy. So we sang the words of this verse a few moments before I preached. It says, strive first for the kingdom of God. That's what we're seeking after. And all those other things, God knows that you need them. God's going to take care of you. 
But what we're seeking after is that thing that truly lasts. Seeking after the kingdom, that priceless eternal thing. And the good news is that it's exactly the thing that God wants you to have. The next verse, don't be afraid. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And that should be freeing, right? It frees us that it's not just all about what we accumulate in this life. It actually frees us to do the opposite. It says, you know, sell stuff. Give stuff. Because in doing so, you're making a purse that doesn't wear out. And what you're striving after is that unfailing treasure in heaven where thieves don't come and moths don't destroy. You're striving for the kingdom, that thing that really lasts. And where your treasure is, there your heart is going to be also. Well, maybe that's a good place for us to stop and think about our challenge from these words, our challenge for today. What we've learned is that disciples are seeking after those things that money can't buy, those things that truly last. And the way we get there is not by spending our way to it, like the commercial says. If anything, it's the opposite. It's holding less tightly to our possessions in this life. It's giving and sharing because we know where they came from. And we know in whom we trust. Jesus invites us to seek those things that really, truly matter. And that means putting our hope in the things to come, the treasures of heaven, more than the treasures of this life. That's viewing our possessions the Jesus way. So the question is, will we act accordingly? And that's a question that I have to ask myself and think about real hard. So I thought maybe it'd be helpful to give us some things maybe we could do to work on this together. Some things to try. Here's the first one. How about let's spend some more time reminding ourselves of what money can't do. You know, we're constantly bombarded with reminders of what money can buy. You can't get away from them. They're everywhere. But what about spending some time thinking about the limitations of wealth, of money, of possessions? You might come up with two, three, or four of these, and you can even have a little fun with it. You know, money can buy a house, but not a home, right? Money can buy a meal, but it can't buy true fellowship, like at a dinner table. Money can buy a book, but not a story. Money can buy an education, but not wisdom, you know, come up with your own. Come up with two, three, four of these. Remind yourself. I was, I was challenged to do this, and it, it helped to kind of reprioritize things. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Second thing, we can all work on replacing our eyes with U's. So the thing that the man in the story struggled with was that he, all he said throughout it was, what did I do to get this stuff, and what am I going to do with it now? But what if we address God first instead, say, what have you done, Lord, to give to me what I have? And why? Thank you, Lord, for giving me what I have, and what are the things that you would want me to do with what I've been given? Replacing our eyes with yous. And then there's this last one. Everybody thinks about investing in retirement. So you should. But what about investing in the ultimate retirement plan? Investing in those things that truly, truly last. Our lives here on earth they are temporary, but the things that we do in this life, they have an eternal impact. And what God has invited us toward is to share in an inheritance that First Peter calls imperishable, 
unfading, and it's not here in this world. It's kept in heaven for you. And the promise of this inheritance is given to us through a new birth into a living hope, all because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That new birth is what our baptism brings to us. It is a new birth. That's what it promises to us. It promises that we are invited into the hope of something more, more than earthly possessions, those things that truly last and never fade. And today, what I would call you to do and what I would leave you with today is that we have to be investing in that in this life every chance that we get. So don't let today be a day that you neglect your investment in things to come. Maybe today is the day that we look past all that comfort and security that earthly possessions seem to bring to our lives and remember that our lives are fleeting, but that God has promised us more. Maybe for some of us, that challenge is remembering the things that money can't buy as you live this week trying to look at your possessions the Jesus way. Maybe for somebody, the challenge is to take hold of that new birth in baptism and the promise of an unfading treasure that it offers to us. However you may be called or challenged, we offer this moment to respond. While we stand, while we sing.